Uh, hi, Michael Straka. I do uh, applied cryptography with uh, C Labs, working on Cello, and uh, put together a small video. It's giving a basic overview and uh, introduction to recursive proof composition, uh, including sort of applications, how it can be used, and also the, the basics of how it's constructed. Uh, so I hope it's useful. Uh, so let's get started. So in this talk, we're going to be covering recursive proof composition. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about some applications, why you might want to use them, and also how they're constructed. Uh, so there's a lot to cover, so we'll just dive right in. First of all, let's recall what a proof is in a proof system or argument system, uh, which is where soundness is com only holds versus computationally bounded adversaries. You have a prover and a verifier. The prover takes in some public input X, which the verifier has also, and also a private input or witness W, which the verifier does not have and if it's a zero knowledge proof, will not uh, will not learn. Uh, and there's also going to be some extractor algorithm, uh, which if a malicious prover convinces the verifier can extract W. So we know that the prover knows W. Prover is going to send a proof pi to the verifier, attesting that XW here is the satisfying input to some arithmetic circuit C. Uh, such that XW are part of some NP relation R. Uh, so basics, I'm assuming most of you know that already, so we can just skip ahead to the more interesting stuff. Uh, so the main abstraction that recursive proofs use is known as proof gearing data. Uh, it's created by, I think, Alessandro Chiesa in his PhD thesis, uh, appropriately titled Proof Carrying Data. And the basic idea is that you're doing some distributed computation. And at each node in this computation, you're going to have some data, say, Z2, and a proof string, say, Pi2. And this proof Pi2 is going to attest to the fact that Z2 was created according to some function uh, specified by a compliance predicate, big pi. And this big pi is going to take in Z2, the claimed output, some local data, Z loc i, which was specific to this node, so no one else necessarily sees it or needs to see it, and also a vector of input data. Here, just z1. So, one application that you could imagine doing with this is, uh, say, Bitcoin. At each node, you're just past, say, z1, the would be the previous data in the blockchain, and Z2 would be a new block, and you're just verifying the proof of work holds. Or you could imagine, uh, there's a paper called PhotoProof that constructs a system using this abstraction where at each step you just verify that uh, you get a photo that is either a crop or a rotation of a previous photo. Right, so you're just enforcing that there's some invariant that holds at each step. And uh, basically the reason why you can do this is, uh, so in a, a normal snark, you have some extractor algorithm that extracts the prover's input, assuming the prover can convince the verifier. So if you have a malicious prover that convinces your verifier, you will always be able to extract a valid witness from that prover. 
And here, what we can basically do is encode the previous proof, say pi1, uh, as a witness to a snark. And then that will allow us to, uh, given pi2 and z2, extract pi1 in addition to z1. Uh, sorry, we won't extract z1, we'll just get z1 as input, right? So given z1, z2, and pi2, we can extract pi1. So we can extract a valid proof that uh, z1 is compliant. And then we can go backwards in the graph, right? And all the way to extracting pi0. So in some sense, what we can do is just extract the entire graph of computation given just uh, sort of the, the output node. So, in order to do this, we can simply compose proofs recursively. So what, what exactly do I mean when I say that? Well, it really just means you have some proof, say uh, a prover sends this verifier pi0, a proof attesting that x0 and w0 are valid, and then this verifier sends another prover, uh, should be the same algorithm, uh, we'll see later on how they can, these two can both be the same, but it's basically because we can just encode in our arithmetic circuit some bit flag that differentiates between the base case here and the sort of more general case that handles recursive proofs. Uh, and basically the, uh, the, this prover here at, at the bottom uh, it's going to take in as part of its witness the previous proof, like we, we were just saying. And it's going to use this to produce another proof by one, which will attest to both the uh, validity of w1 prime here, which can be valid in the same way that w0 was here. Uh, it's, you think of it as being approved by the same sub-circuit in our arithmetic circuit. And then also pi zero, which is going to be uh, just going to be checked with the snark verification algorithm inside of an arithmetic circuit itself. So pi one here attests also to the validity of pi zero. And then we can just, uh, you're given the correct construction, we can sort of compose these indefinitely. Uh, there's actually a technicality that prevents abstraction or extraction for unbounded recursion, but uh, we'll gloss over that for now. Uh, so if we take go back to uh, the PCDs and how one instance of that would look, it's basically uh, the prover is going to take in some local data, some uh, input, the previous input, uh, some say, proving key specific to the prover, and some verifier key. Uh, the, the verifier takes in some verification key. And then, see here, is going to be the claimed output that both the prover and verifier need access to. And the prover is going to send the uh, a new proof generated at the nth step. So, say we're doing, uh, it's kind of an, an inductive case where we just take in one proof at a time and we generate, so we take in proof pi i and just generate proof pi i plus one. Uh, so here proof p would just take in uh, pi sort of n minus one and then generate pi n and send that to the verifier. Mm. So how might we actually do uh, instantiate recursion with an arithmetic circuit? But like I was saying, what we could just do is uh, have an arithmetic circuit, part of which would check some compliance predicate, pi, uh, so that if we have a input, a x is a public input, and then some witness with part of which is previous proof, uh, the w prime here would be checked 
by the compliance predicate. And then pi here would just be checked by CV, which is actually just the verification algorithm of the SNARK encoded in an arithmetic circuit. Right, so we can actually decompose that pretty nicely, but there's a problem here, and that is that we're going to have, uh, so we're, we're going to want to instantiate our SNARK with an elliptic curve. Let's say it's E over F T, so this just means the elliptic curve E instantiated uh, using the base P field FP. So the finite field of order P, that it has P elements. Mm. Uh, so this, this is actually a problem because if we look at the order, the size of the elliptic curve, this is going to have Q points. But uh, for certain technical reasons, Q will not be equal to P. So this means that the, our arithmetic circuit, uh, just like the gates, So this is uh, it's just uh, computes arithmetic you know, addition or multiplication in FP. And this is going to be it using FQ arithmetic. Uh, what's known as the scalar field, which is the same order as the curve itself, because if uh, if you do uh, I apologize for using multiplicative notation, uh, so mm, you know, please don't lock me away. But uh, if you do computations with the elliptic curve. Uh, they're going to look something like this, where you're actually doing, uh, sorry, you're actually doing computations in the exponent of the curve elements. And this is going to be effectively in the field FQ. So, but uh, when we do elliptic curve operations itself, they're actually going to reduce down to computations in this base field FP. So, uh, you're basically going to be able to be trying to do, when you do the snark verification algorithm encoded in the circuit, you're going to try to do FP arithmetic in a circuit uh, defined over the finite field FQ. And this is a problem because it, uh, you're going to end up need to do a lot of modulus operations, which will reduce the kind of bits that... Uh, you know, bit bitwise operations are very expensive in arithmetic circuits, so this is going to be really expensive. The blow up is going to be logarithmic in the size of your base field. It's going to be really bad. So you don't want to do this. What you really want to do is uh, you want to be able to define a cycle of elliptic curves. Say E over FP and uh, E1 over F. Uh, it's going to get confusing. Uh, EQ over FP and then EP over F, uh, FQ. Where, uh, say the order of this curve is P, the order of this curve is Q, and uh, they're the size of each, each other's base fields. Right, so. Why, why do we want to do this? Well, we can actually compose these, these two curves in, in the following manner. So instead of having one arithmetic circuit, we can have two, such that one circuit uh, on the left is going to do our compliance predicate, as we, we were discussing earlier. Uh, the other sub-circuit will be the uh, SNARK verification algorithm, uh, note, we have VQ and v, VR here. That's because uh, we're basically going to to have two instantiations of the snark, one for each elliptic curve. Uh, all right, so. Okay. 
that's uh, you, you, we're going to have one for, per arithmetic circuit. Uh, and then each circuit is, so the circuit defined over FR is going to need to use the, the verifier for the, the elliptic curve of order Q because its base field will be of order R. So it's actually, you can do that base field arithmetic in CR, right? So basically each circuit needs it the other SNARKs verification code embedded in it. Uh, and then once you can be the sort of main proof here that verifies the compliance predicate or attests to the correct satisfaction of the compliance predicate, you send it to the next circuit, which is sort of a wrapper circuit. And then that one is simply going to verify that this proof is correct and then generate a new proof that it is. And in this manner, you can sort of achieve a consistent, you can ensure that the, the proofs you generate are all verifiable by the same uh, kind of snark algorithm. Uh, right, you just kind of use the circuit to convert the arithmetic back to the, the form that you want. Uh, so if we look at how this, the actual mm, sort of implementation of this, uh, we could do in pseudocode, uh, and this actually isn't quite quite what you would want because you'd actually need to reduce the uh, public input, right? The public input here would need to be smaller so that the verification key would uh, would be small enough as the verification key is going to get bigger the larger the public input is because that's going to blow up the size of uh, of the you know the, the input that the verifier needs to take in. Uh, so you can do that with a pretty simple hashing trick. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, um, it's something you need to take care of. Uh, basically. In the concrete implementation, uh, it's just what I was discussing, except you also need some like base field bit flag to ensure that you can deal with the base case effectively, because you're not going to need to activate a VQ here, right? There's no previous proof to verify. Uh, so that's actually how you would instantiate fully recursive snarks. Mm, but there's some bad news. Mm, let me find it. Yeah, the bad news is here. So basically, uh, the, the, the current instantiation of cycles of elliptic curves we have are known as the MNT curves. Uh, ironically, they're some of the first elliptic curves considered for you know, cryptographic applications, uh, and they're also the only ones we found a usable sort of pairing-friendly cycles, a cycle where both curves are pairing-friendly. And if you're using, a, in both circuits, you're using a pairing-friendly snark, then you need both elliptic curves to be pairing-friendly. But that's that's just how it is. Uh, but unfortunately, the embedding degrees for both of these curves are, are very low. Uh, we'll get to why that's important in a second. Uh, and you know, there's some other restrictions that don't look too good. Uh, you can read them here. I'm not I'm not going to go into them either. Uh, these are also from a paper by uh, Chiesa and some friends. So mm, it's not clear how likely it is that we'll find something else that's workable in the near future. Uh, so there are a few ways people propose getting around this, but basically the problem is that uh, in a pairing algorithm, which is, you know, in some sense, the reason you would want to use it is because it gives you this nice structure in the form of bilinearity, which is shown here, right? If you have the E X to the A Y to the B, that's going to equal E X Y to the A times B. Uh, so that's a very nice property to have. It lets you design nice um, argument systems. Uh, but uh, it's also, it's not just a constructive technique, it can also be used to form attacks in the sense that uh, most pairings are instantiated with two sort of, uh, subgroups of the uh, R torsion uh, group of the elliptic curve. Uh, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's you can just think of these two as subgroups of the elliptic curve for now. Uh, but they map onto uh, here a finite field or the multiplicative group of a finite field. Uh, right, it's just the field restricted to multiplication operations, and that's going to be of order uh, right. Q to the R, or 
more, more standard would be uh, q to the k, where k is your embedding degree and q is the size of your base field. So the higher your embed, so you can use this to translate the discrete logarithm in elliptic curves to the discrete logarithm in, in finite fields. Uh, so the larger this, this field is, the more security you're going to have in the finite field discrete log problem. Uh, so, so to get more security there, you either need a high, larger base field or a larger em embedding degree. And since the embedding degrees here are so low, we need larger base fields. And that can make things quite inefficient in snark land. The reprover is going to get pretty slow, uh, at least relative to what it could be if you used a smaller base field. So uh, it's not a great situation. There are some ways of getting around this. If you only need finite depth recursion, you can use what's called the Cox pinch method to uh, generate uh, sort of uh, chains of elliptic curves so that you can't compose them back and forth indefinitely, but you can kind of compose one into the other and then stop. So you do like depth two or depth three recursion and then stop there. Uh, although the base field doubles in size roughly every time you do that, so it does get very slow if you keep doing it indefinitely, but your first curve is going to be a lot faster. Uh, we're, so uh, another thing that's interesting is that if you uh, if you look back at this diagram, you don't actually need to instantiate both circuits with the same argument system. So one thing that's been proposed, uh, sort of specifically by a, a GitHub post by <laughs> As some people at Zcash is uh, you could use for the circuit on the left something like Groth 16 or Marlin that uses R1CS and uh, just sort of you know just a normal snark that uses a pairing from the curve and then use on the circuit on the right you could instantiate that with Halo or uh, you know theory and other non just any argument system that doesn't require pairings. Uh, but Halo seems like the best choice right now. Uh, and, you know, the, the, uh, the thing that's not so great about Halo is that it's, um, you know, it's not succinct. There's no, like, sort of pre-processing generator algorithm that can give you a succinct, uh, uh, sort of helper data in the form of a proving key and verifying key. So there, you know, the basic intuition is that it's going to need to read in the circuit itself. So your asymptotics are going to be linear in the size of the circuit, at least. Uh, but you, you can compose that with uh, a snark to get uh, something that in the end does provide succinctness, right? Because this proof here is going to be succinct. So uh, in the, uh, the, the base fields you get from these sort of half pairing friendly cycles are going to be about half the size of M and P curves, so it's actually, uh, they're actually pretty usable. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, here, are, these are the main papers that I sort of constructed this presentation from. They're also great resources if you want to learn more. Um, we also have a new uh, project at working on at C Labs that kind of touches on it's a, sort of at least finite depth recursion. Uh, I think Kobe's already talked about that. Uh, so that's also something to look at if you're interested. Um, of course, there are also some other great projects doing work with recursive snarks like Coda and Zcash. Uh, and so thanks for your time.